Well, thank you very much for having Thank you very much for this kind introduction and I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for inviting me. So my, my topic today is guidelines in urology. Um, before I start, I wanted to reaffirm that I have no financial conflicts of interest with this presentation. Uh, I do have uh, potential intellectual conflicts of interest. You'll hear a lot about GRADE and systematic reviews done by Cochrane. So I'm a, you'll hear more about GRADE, but I'm a member of the GRADE working group. I'm also a founding member of the U.S. GRADE network, which is basically the representation of GRADE in the U.S., and I'm coordinating editor of Cochrane Urology. So I'm quite passionate about evidence-based medicine. And just to provide you a background, what I mean, so what we, when we think of evidence-based medicine today, we think of the coalescing of three movements. One is evidence-based medicine per se that we actually associate with Canada and McMaster University, systematic reviews that we associate with the Cochrane collaboration, and then finally clinical practice guidelines, which, I'll, which is the topic of my talk. So I would be amiss of coming to Canada and giving grand rounds about an EBM-related topic without giving credit to these uh, uh, two individuals that uh, not both of them are Canadian, but that both of them worked and, and, and did some of their great work in Canada. So, so David Sackett is the founder of Evidence-Based Medicine. He was a, a U.S. family physician that came to McMaster University and founded the first Center for Evidence-Based Medicine and then went on and did the same in, in Oxford in the UK. Uh, Gordon Guyatt uh, followed into his footstep. He's actually the one that coined the term evidence-based medicine. He's still very active uh, at, at McMaster University. And the, the focus of, of EBM as it came out of McMaster is the emphasis that every single provider, every single one of you should have a framework for critically appraising the literature. So, and, and one of the main accomplishments of this, this work is the user's guide to the medical literature. It's, if you will, the holy book of the EBM movement. I keep it under my pillow at all times. Um, the first author is Gordon Guyatt, and it basically, you know, provides a framework for critically appraising the literature. And a long time ago, 10 years ago, I, I really thought it would be important for translating those concepts into urology examples. So, there's, there's a user's guide to the urological literature that was, it's a series of eight articles that was published in the Journal of Urology now quite some time ago. So the second EBM movement relates to systematic reviews. We associate that with Sir Archie Cochrane. He was the one that recognized that if you had a specific question, you shouldn't look at just one study, but you should use the well-defined methods to pull together the body of evidence and, and critically praise this evidence. Um, and, and, you know, his work led to the formation of the Cochrane Collaboration. Um, this is, you might be familiar with our logo. It's a stylized forest plot. The, the clinical example is actually that of, a, of the use of antenatal steroids in children with, who are premature that are, are at high risk for, for being born with uh, immature lungs. There were, at the time, there were a number of studies that were all inconclusive. Only when you pull them all together, you saw that this really made a difference. And giving, giving steroids in this setting became the standard of care. So coming to guidelines, guidelines, something that really started in the U.S. And it arose from the recognition that there was a lot of unexplained variation in care. Um, this is an old example taken from the Dartmouth Atlas, and it shows you that there was a lot of differences in rates of TURP across the country that could not be explained to differences in the patients. So they adjusted this analysis, say, for the age of the <coughs> patients and so on. And nevertheless, there was a three- to four-fold differences in, in, in what this TURP uh, were performed. Now, I recently found a more contemporary example that might resonate particularly well with you here in Vancouver. So this is a publication in the Canadian Journal of Emergency Medicine. And this is a study by an emergency group um, based in Calgary that looked at the rates of primary intervention for patients with ureteral colic. And it compared what is happening in Vancouver and what is happening in Calgary. And these are the rates of primary intervention. So patients presented to the emergency room, they had stones of varying sizes, 
And this is, these are the rates with which they underwent either stenting or primary ureteroscopy. And you can see there are staggering differences between the two. Um, so it looks as if in Vancouver, most of these patients underwent conservative medical therapy, presumably maybe medical expulsive therapy alongside. In Calgary, on the other hand, you know, a lot of these underwent primary intervention. So this is, this is the best example I have that there is unexplained variability in care. I can only muse about what the, what the drivers are this to this, but this is why we need clinical practice guidelines to sort this out and see what, what is the most appropriate care. So clinical practice guidelines, this is a definition I'll just read to you, systematically developed statements to help practitioner and patient decisions about appropriate health care for specific clinical circumstances. So it's supposed to help you at the point of care. You have a question, something that you don't deal with every day. You look at a guideline. It's supposed to give you an answer. And to me, this is really where the evidence-based medicine rubber hits the road. So what do we look for when we read a clinical practice guidelines? Well, broadly speaking, you want to know whether they should do something or should not do something. Right? And then second to that, it should provide you some graduation as to should you do it most of the time or should you do it sometimes? So this, this is what we refer to as grading the strength of recommendation. Things that go into a recommendation is obviously the quality of evidence, how certain are we that these research findings that point in this direction are true, but also the relationship of benefit to harm. You should think about patients' values and preferences, how well they are known, to what extent they vary, and then you should consider resource utilization, um, although this is, this is not routinely done. Now, there are, unfortunately, many problems with guidelines. So one of the issues is that there are conflicting guidelines from different organizations in every space, including urology. These guidelines use different systems for making their guidelines and different systems for rating the quality of evidence. There is still an incomplete separation of the quality of evidence and strength of recommendation, and I'll get to that some more, and many of these guidelines still not rate the strength of recommendation. Many guidelines are unclear, not really useful. You open them up, it doesn't help you what to do, and, and historically a lot of guidelines have been outdated. Some of you that are older, like me, might remember that the prostate cancer guidelines of the AUA have not been updated for 10 years until they fairly recently were updated. So guidelines that are 10 years old are, are no good. They don't serve their purpose. So uh, a few years I had an opportunity to, to write about this problem that really that we should all use a, the same system. And as part of that, we looked at, I, I know that you can not read the details of this, but these are the main organizations that create guidelines in urology, the AUA, BAUS in Britain, the CUA, as represented by, at the time, Hassan Razvi, the EAU, NICE, and the SIU, and pretty much they all used a different system. So this leads to, so it's like everybody speaking a different language. This is, there was a Babylonian guideline confusion. Now, there, there is a system that, that, could help with this, and, and, and this system is GRADE. So GRADE is, is a system that was developed by a, um, what was at the time and continues to be an informal group of clinicians and methodologists. They were frustrated with the systems that were available to rate the quality of evidence and to come up with guidance documents, and they came up with, at the time, what was a new system for doing so. Um, this is our website. And as I said, it's still very informal. So if you want to become a grade member, you have about 500 members now. You send us an email, and then you'll be a grade member. You can come to our meetings. You participate in methodological projects and, and so on. And this is our website. So up to now, um, over 100 organizations have adopted grade. You might recognize some of the names. So, for example, um, I guess this pointer may not show up, but... You'll recognize uh, societies that you that you know, so the CDC. Um, there is Healthcare Ontario, the Canadian Cardiovascular Society. So actually, some of the Canadian societies are listed here, 
Um, the most prominent are probably the uh, CADTH, your health technology agency here in Canada, uh, and the Canadian Task Force Preventive Medicine. I understand Fraser Health is something that is based here. I had to look that up. And then the Canadian Men's Health Association is also based in Vancouver. So they apparently have a guideline on testosterone replacement. So these are organizations that have already used GRADE. Um, we've also, last year in Montreal, there was a workshop that we did for the CU CUA. So I, I understand that the CUA is also moving in that direction. So GRADE has four levels for the quality of evidence. These are high, moderate, low, and very low. And strength of recommendation, either strong for or weak for. And then the same can happen against, weak against, or strong against. So, so one of the things that I think Gray does better than any other framework is to operationalize what that means. So when you make a strong recommendation, that means for patients, most people in your situation would want the recommended course of action, and only a small proportion would not. Request discussion if intervention is not offered. For urologists, most patients should receive the recommended course of action. Right? Only, only very few do not. The shorthand of that is just do it. It's things that you can just do. For policymakers, the recommendation can be adopted as policy in most cases. So these are measures that lend themselves well in some cases as performance measures. Meanwhile, weak recommendations means that most people in your situation would want the recommended course of action, but many would not. From you on the provider side, that means that different choices will be appropriate for different patients, must help each patient with decision consistent with his values and preferences. So this is where shared decision making is, is important for policymakers. Policy making will require substantial debate and involvement of many stakeholders. So these are not good performance measures. <coughs> so how is grade different? What are the, some of the contributions? So, so one of them is that um, it's it's it focuses on patient important outcomes. So, you know, there are surrogate outcomes and there are things that really matter to patients. So grade is about those patient important outcomes. We rate the quality of evidence and grade recognizes that that is more than just study design. And also that the quality of evidence may vary by outcome. And lastly, there's no automatism from the quality of evidence to strength of recommendation. So you may go to a meeting plenary and somebody gets up and says there is level one evidence and that's why we should do something. So that what that person usually means is there's a, at least one randomized controlled trial that provides high level evidence. So there are two issues with that. Does that study really provide high, high level evidence? And there are other things that affect our decision to do something or not. So um, grade starts by you know, formulating a focused clinical question and then giving some thought into what are the outcomes that really matter to our patient. So when you do a grade guideline panel, one of the first thing you think about is what are the, all the outcomes that matter and what are the outcomes that are most important to patients? And then typically the panel will rate these outcomes on a scale from one to nine. And outcomes that come out of seven to nine, we call them critical for decision-making those that are rated four to six, we call important. Those that are one to three are not important and are then not carried forward. So to make that clear what I'm talking about, this is, this is something I made up, how a panel might rate outcomes or a guideline for clinically localized prostate cancer. Well, we can assume that patients care about survival, living long, not dying, of, of any reason not dying of prostate cancer in particular, they typically also care a lot about their <coughs> urinary and their sexual function. So those would likely be outcomes that are critical for decision making. They might care less about downstream complications that are relatively rare, such as bladder neck contractures. They presumably would also care less about blood transfusions, and presumably they don't really care per se how long in their operating room as long as their outcomes are good. So this is just an example. I'm not saying this is right, but this is how might this may play, play out in a guideline for localized prostate cancer. So you may be familiar with this framework, the so-called hierarchy of evidence that we associate with the Center of Evidence-Based Medicine in Oxford. It continues to be widely used and widely quoted. 
So people talk about level one evidence and they mean their randomized controlled trials or systematic reviews. So there are two problems with this framework. One is you will all have awareness of the fact that not always do randomized controlled trials provide high quality evidence. I'm sure you can, each one of you can cite at least one randomized controlled trial that is fatally flawed and wasn't worth the paper it was written. The second thing is if you do a systematic review of studies that are of poor quality, the quality does not get better. Right? So there's no reason why systematic reviews per se should be at the top of this list. So uh, Hassan Murad, who works at the uh, Mayo Clinic, came up with this different picture of this hierarchy of evidence. And two things are different. One, the, the, the top is chopped off. And second is the lines between the different study designs are, are wavy. And it means to symbolize that sometimes randomized controlled trials provide lower quality evidence than observational studies and vice versa. So our take on this is that really systematic reviews that use grade as a framework for rating the quality of evidence is like a tool, a magnifying glass that allows you to look at any kind of evidence, be it randomized controlled trials or case studies. So um, once again, this, is, this looks at one of the differences. Historically, systems for rating the quality of evidence will look at individual studies and rate them. Rate is outcome-centric and will look across the study. Sorry, will look at a body of evidence across uh, of studies. The other thing, historically, you know, systems for rating the quality of evidence will look at study design mainly and some of the methodological limitations, such as you know, whether the study was blinded or not. Grade has added some additional dimensions, such as things called indirectness, inconsistency, imprecision, and the risk of publication. And this is how this all comes together. So um, in, in grade, there is um, um, a body of evidence from randomized controlled trials starts off as high quality evidence, oops, starts off as high quality evidence, but there are a number of reasons why you might downgrade the quality of evidence. Meanwhile, observational studies start off as low quality evidence, but there are some reasons to upgrade that quality of evidence. And this is exemplified in, in this, this publication that is quoted both by proponents and opponents of evidence-based medicine. So I'll just read you some sections here. This is an actual publication. Anybody know this? Anybody seen this? Okay. Good. So Parachute used to prevent death and major trauma related to gravitational challenge, a systematic review of randomized controlled trials. What is already known about the subject, parachutes are widely used to prevent death and major injury after gravitational challenge. What the study adds, no randomized controlled trials of parachute use has been undertaken. And lastly, individuals who insist that all interventions need to be validated by a randomized controlled trial need to come down to earth with a bump. Any uh, parachutist here in the room? Anybody? Nobody who wants to speak up. Okay. Well, we, we trust parachutes, right? And, and it's true. There are no randomized control trials. So, so what is unique about this parachute example? The unique thing is that the effect size in medical speak is huge, right? Pretty much everybody who jumps with a parachute lives. Everybody who jumps without dies. Huge difference. Right? We don't care whether they were randomized or the outcome assessor was blinded. What we believe this, this is going to be real, even if the study design was flawed. Right? <coughs> so, so sometimes we have examples in medicine where the same concept applies, where we have increased confidence because the effect size is very large. So these are some examples, steroids for acute asthma, colchicine for gout, epinephrine for anaphylaxis, hip replacement for debilitating osteoarthritis. And you know, one example that I could come up with um, in urology might be that when you have a patient with hormone-naive metastatic prostate cancer with spinal cord compression, you androgen ablate them, it's like magic. You know, within days, they, 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 uh, they, they lose their symptoms and they can walk. So another example of, of things where we're very confident that something works, even while there are no randomized control trials. So this is how, how this all comes together for the quality of evidence. You start with a focused clinical question, and then there's a defined framework for rating the quality of evidence, looking at all these different dimensions. Now, the imperative 
for clinical practice guidelines. One of them came from this report by the Institute of Medicine, now the National Academy of Science. Um, and they set standards for trustworthy guidelines, which are the following. Transparency, you need to know who's funding the guideline, for example. There needs to be a conflict of interest disclosure. You should have stakeholder representation. So if you're a clinically localized prostate cancer, radiation versus surgery, you should have some radiation oncologist in the room, right? You should, it should be based on a high quality systematic review. The strength of recommendation should be rated. At the end of the day, the recommendations should be clear and actionable. There should be external review and there should be timely updates. So all these things actually make, make a lot of sense. Until recently, there was a great resource for finding clinical practice guidelines. But given the change in our political landscape in the US, this, um, this organization and this website is now defunded. But there used to be the National Guideline Clearinghouse which set minimal standards and would list guidelines that, that met these minimal standards. The EAU and the AUA guidelines are included. I always like to point out that the <coughs> NCCN guidelines, which are very widely used, are actually not considered evidence-based guidelines for a variety of reasons. Another thing that the Institute of Medicine... Yeah, so they... Yep. So they are not, they don't do a systematic literature search and they don't have, they don't really rate the quality of evidence using a system that kind of is timely up to date. And it is also not clear how they move from, how they go from the, what deliberation goes into, I mean, they, they'll say it's a consensus based process if you look at the you look at them. They say this is, they essentially vote on this. Is there, it's more like, do they agree or do they not agree? So, so some of these elements are missing and this is, this is just not a, did you, did you have a question? No, no, sorry, sorry. Okay. Just nodding. Good. Um, right. So, so very influential organizations. And, and I must say that the guidelines are very user-friendly, these algorithms, but the caveat is that, um, it's not considered a, an evidence-based guideline. So one of the things that I pointed out already is that, uh, you know, so um, guidelines need to be based on systematic reviews, high quality systematic reviews. So since I have an interest in this, I've been tracking systematic reviews that are published in the urology literature. You may all have a feeling for this. There's been this explosion of systematic reviews. Um, and this, is, this looks at, at the four major journals uh, I apologize that the Canadian journal, none of the Canadian journals is included. We'll fix that in the future. Uh, but, you know, exponential rise in the number of, 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 um, of journal publications, and, and that might have two reasons. One is because really people recognize that systematic reviews are important, but another factor is also that they're heavily cited. So you can raise the impact factor of a, of a journal by publishing a lot of systematic reviews. So... More importantly, we we're interested in the quality of these systematic reviews. And I liken the quality of a systematic review to this, what you see here. Now, wherever I show this slide, people can usually map this to something that they may eat in their state or province. Do you have anything that looks like this that you would eat? Or not really, you would not eat this. <laughs> yeah. So this is meant to be a, a, a bouillabaisse, Marseillaise, famous fish soup in the uh, in, uh, city of Marseille in southern France. And the parallel I see there that uh, before you get in line, you probably want to make sure that the gentleman who's serving you has washed his hands and knows what he's doing. Right? So that maps to the skill and expertise in doing a systematic review. And the other thing you want to be sure that he only uses fresh, the freshest ingredients, right? So um, one foul fish in there and the whole soup goes bad. So it's the same here in a systematic review, you need to carefully look at what, what goes into what you include. 
So in, in order to look at the quality, we used a tool called Amstar. So Amstar is actually also another contribution of your country to evidence-based medicine. It's a validated tool that was developed by Bev Shea, who's at the University of Ottawa. And it rates, it, it allows you to score systematic reviews on a scale from 0 to 11 with higher scores indicating better quality. So we looked at those four journals. We looked at three time frames, and we looked at where the quality had improved. And we found that quality was very similar across journals for these three time periods. These are the actual scores, so you can see it's pretty much a wash. So we concluded that the quality of systematic reviews, for the most part, in these four journals is modest with little improvement over time. So, sorry, yes. if you include the Cochrane reviews in there, compare Cochrane reviews to there, is it higher? I, I hope so. I very much hope so. <laughs> yeah. So we, um, so some of the Cochrane reviews get co-published co in other journals. Uh, actually, uh, historically in the in BJU <coughs> International, and we actually have a recent agreement with the CUA journal with Rob Siemens, and the first Cochrane review will get co-published there. Um, the, the, the so these are going to be tremendously abbreviated Cochrane reviews that are actually going to be more palatable to a clinical audience. So you might have, I don't know whether you've ever looked at a Cochrane review, don't make the mistake of hitting print because it will, it may well have a hundred pages, right? So these co-publications in, in other journals are a lot more manageable and readable. So, so yeah, those, those should be, should be better and I'll try to make that point even more so. So you might say, uh, how do I care about the Amstar score? Give me the details. So this is, these are the 11 criteria, once again, distinguishing between these time periods and just to highlight some of them. So, so only two-thirds of them considered even consider the quality of evidence. Right? So the quality of evidence tells you, can you believe the results? Right? So it's really important. I don't care what the number is for the outcome. If I don't believe the result, if I'm very uncertain, then, then it doesn't really matter. So you need a quality of evidence rating. Only about a third considered the issue of publication bias. So you're probably familiar with this, right? So if you publish a study, um, it doesn't have to be a trial, but something that looks at, you think that A is better than B, and then at the end of the day, A is not better than B, then the air is out of the bat, right? So whoever is, you know, you as an investigator might not be as excited about publishing if somebody funded it, they're not pushing for you to, you know, it's not going to be the New England Journal of Medicine, right? It's, it's, so for a variety of reasons, negative studies are, are, have received much less awareness. And unless you actively seek out those studies, you're going to miss them and your results will be biased, right? You are going to more likely show that something works than it doesn't. And lastly, very important to guideline developers, you really want to know who funded the studies that went into the systematic review. And you also want to know who funded the systematic review. Right? So sometimes you'll have, well, not sometimes, oftentimes systematic reviews will be funded by the company that makes a given drug, right? And you can anticipate how the results will fall, right? So you need to pay attention to that. So um, Karash already asked me how might Cochrane reviews be different. So we asked authors to write a protocol, that protocol gets peer-reviewed and then gets published. We have a very stringent conflict of interest policy, so it's not that people with conflict of interest can't be engaged, but it has to be a limited number of people. We focus on patient important outcomes and we use grade to rate the quality of evidence. A little more advertising for our group. <laughs> the, it, it, we used to be the Prostatic Diseases and Urological Cancers Group. It was founded by Tim Wilt, who is actually not a urologist. He's a family care physician who actually works at the Minneapolis VA. Um, he passed this off to me a few years ago. You might know him as the lead investigator of the PIVOT trial. He was also the face of the United States Preventive Services Task Force on PSA screening. So he would take the beating from the urology audience why it was a level D recommendation against prostate cancer screening. Um, so we're still based at the Minneapolis VA and our scope 
um, after we grew up, re renamed, got expanded, so now we include stone disease, male sexual dysfunction, hydrocele's, and things like that. And this is our website, and if you're interested in doing a Cochrane review, I would be excited to hear from you. So, getting, returning back to guidelines, if, if you've ever sat on a guideline panel, this might resonate with you. So you do all these discussions, and then somebody says, I thought we agreed on, what did we decide? Didn't we already discuss that? What about, I absolutely disagree. Right? So there are oftentimes issues with the process. And um, one of the things, so, so, so GRADE has developed a framework for how this process should ideally work. And one of the things that is important and that is inconsistently done is that at the end of the day, it is also helpful to have consistent wording. And I'll show you some examples from other guidelines. This is a busy slide, you can't really read it, but um, this is a framework, this is basically a checklist that we go, go through when you do a grade guideline. So you think about is the problem really important? How large are the desirable effects? How large are the undesirable effects? What is the certainty of evidence? And so on. And then, and then there are additional domains such as equity, acceptability, and feasibility. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. So, um, you know, how are some of the other frameworks different? So NCCN came up with it. It's very, a very prominent guideline developer. Um, it's very user-friendly what they come up with. They're usually up to date. They update their guidelines many, many times. Very authoritative. They actually are used in the U.S. to... Um, you know, for payment decisions, so CMS, Center for Medicare, will use them if it's an NCCN, they'll pay, if not, maybe not, right, but it does not meet these minimal standards as we discussed. So the guideline, the AUA, um, has, has also come a long way. They have a very formulated process. They, they invest a lot of money into their systematic reviews that they oftentimes outsour outsource. Um, they use GRADE, face-to-face -face meetings, and they have their recommendations in, in five categories, of, of which three of them are evidence-based. So, so in a nutshell, they kind of use grade in the back end, but the front end, the recommendations, still use a, a different format. And I've been working hard to, to change that for over a decade. So this is what the AUA currently uses, strong recommendation, moderate recommendation, conditional recommendation. I, I put this into my own language, so for all practical purposes, I translate this as strong recommendation, a strong recommendation and grade. Moderate recommendation is what we call a conditional, a weak recommendation. It should be done in most people. Shared decision making is important. And conditional recommendation is really, we don't really know, can be done, but, but unclear whether it's better or not. So they have these two additional uh, rate, these two additional categories, something called a clinical principle and one called an expert opinion, and those are the definitions that the AUA provide. So in grade, we have something similar. We, we, what, what maps to the clinical principle is what we call a good practice statement or motherhood statement. So we have things that we think that guideline developers may want to say, but that don't need to be rated. And, and this is the case when, they're, when the benefit is large and unequivocal, and it's very difficult to collect all the usually indirect evidence, and the opposite would, would sound ridiculous. So, for example, you know, uh, when seeing a urology patient, you should do a complete history and physical. Right? So saying the opposite makes no sense, and it's kind of self-evident. And the guideline development may want to drop the whole thing altogether, but if you feel compelled to put that statement in, we would call it a good practice statement don't have to rate it. Now, one of the areas where we don't see eye to eye is the AUA is this thing called expert opinion. We think there's really no expert opinion. It's really when so-called experts uh, talk about expert opinion, they mean evidence. It's, it's really their own. It's, it's indirect evidence. It's low quality evidence. It's observation that are uncontrolled, that they then filtered. And, and then they call it expert opinion, but it's still evidence, and we should, they should make every evidence to, to document that evidence. And that can be even done by a 
quick survey of the panel members. You can get these experts to write down where this evidence comes from. So we would recommend getting rid of this category of expert opinion. EAU also makes guidelines. They are of increasingly high quality. Um, they get updated frequently, even more so than those of the AOA. Um, they're committed. They've made a commitment towards grade. Um, and there's a publication about their process, but the, the panels move at different speeds. So, for example, the pediatric urology panel, I think, moves at a slow speed. But I, I, I don't know whether... Anyway, we can baby talk steps. about baby steps. But they're moving, right? I'm a, I'm a half-full kind of a guy. Um, one of the guidelines that explicitly uses GRADE and is, is a great guideline in my mind looks at the VTE prophylaxis in urological surgery. So they made a, a number of assumptions with regards to because there's so little direct evidence, but they have a very nice transparent process. Um, you can you can see here what uh, so I just these are some examples. So say for open cystectomy, they distinguish between different risk categories, and you know they for these people that get an open cystectomy, pretty much consistently they make a strong recommendation for pharmacological prophylaxis. Whereas when you do a robotic cystectomy, the baseline risk is lower. They call this a conditional recommendation. You may de agree or disagree with this, but it's a very, it's the handiwork of the guideline is very well done. and It is transparent. It's at least transparent how they, how they got there. Lastly, I wanted to tell you about one more new development, um, guidelines that are independent of any professional organization. There's something called rapid recommendation, which started as a collaboration between the BMJ and the, um, and the MAGIC group. MAGIC stands for Making Grade the, an Irresistible Choice. Making, yes, Making Grade the Irresistible Choice. So it's, a, it's an offshoot of the grade working group. They're based in Norway, and they get frustrated around that a lot of guidelines are low quality, then it also takes them a long time to act. So their idea is they, they basically look for pivotal landmark trials that are being published, update systematic reviews, and then have an independent guideline panel that offers um, new guidance within three months. And um, one of these, um, this is just, um, so most of them are published in the BMJ. There's also one that relates to urology that was published in BJU International. This is a rapid rec that I was involved in because it was based on one of the Cochrane reviews on medical expulsive therapy. So uh, this is an infographic that shows that they, they made a weak recommendation for the use of alpha blockers. And this is the, this is the evidence that, that went into this number of pain episodes, expected number of hospitalizations, which all appear to favor medical expulsive therapy. So coming to the end of my talk, Guidelines are critical to, evidence, to the evidence-based practice of urology. You should pay attention to them, and you probably do already. Uh, they do require rigorous and transparent methodology. It should be based on high-quality systematic reviews, and there should be a clear process from moving from evidence to recommendation. And using GRADE would help, um, would help with collaboration and would help to, to share resources. So lastly, a little uh, advertisement for our GRADE workshop. So our next grade workshop is in Colorado, so we spend three days uh, talking about grade, and uh, that's all I had. Thank you very much for your time.